It is a chilly morning, late summer of the year 394. The host of the Eastern Roman Empire follows Via Gemina, winding its way through the mountainous region that stretches between the cities of Amona and Aquileia. Moving in the rear guard, Emperor Theodosius grows increasingly distressed as he had expected to make first contact with the enemy hours ago. Then, a somewhat extraordinary upheaval edged with angst could be heard rippling through the van. This could mean only one thing. The battle was about to begin. It's the middle of autumn of the year 389. Flavius Theodosius, Roman Emperor in the East, holds court in the imperial city of Mediolanum, at the time serving as the center of the West. It may sound uncommon, but his recent victory on the banks of the Sava River had made Theodosius the single most powerful man in the Roman realm, enabling him to lay claim to both halves of the empire. He cleverly played on the weakness of the young Western Emperor Valentinian and expelled him to a remote residence across the Alps. There, put under the watchful eye of a trusted general, it was ensured that Valentinian remained a meaningless pawn in the world of greater politics. Meanwhile, Emperor Theodosius fought his own battle with the decaying Roman state and the rising position of the church. Although a devout Christian himself, Theodosius struggled to keep imperial affairs free of external pressure, showing his strong will and open mind. Possibly to solidify his position on the throne, over the years, Theodosius issued a number of decrees heavily favoring Nicene Christianity at the expense of other faiths. These actions brought him mixed results. Some handled better, some others, like an atrocious massacre that occurred in 390, not so much. In any case, Theodosius fared quite well given the circumstances, and in 391 went back to Constantinople to oversee the East. But soon things got a bit complex. In spring of 392, rumors spread that far to the west General Arbogast proved his abilities and enjoyed absolute power, which obviously caused much hatred and bitterness in young Valentinian, who was still under the control of the Frankish general. At one instance, the Western Emperor tried to dismiss Arbogast, but the latter publicly scoffed at the order, tore it up, saying, You have neither given me my command, nor will you be able to take it away, upon walking out. Several weeks later, Valentinian was found hanged in his chamber. In spite of rumors circling the shady death of the Western Emperor, Arbogast couldn't have ruled himself due to his rather unimpressive lineage. So, just three months later, he found a figurehead. A former rhetoric teacher, Eugenius was hailed as the new emperor of the West in August of 392. At once, emissaries were sent to Constantinople seeking recognition from Theodosius. The Eastern Emperor was either surprised or played for time, as the envoys were not given a clear answer. Theodosius' mind only settled in the beginning of the next year when he declared Honorius his underage son as the true emperor in the West. Such a demonstration prompted Arbogast and his puppet to invade Italy in the spring of 393. Upon his triumphal entrance to Rome, Eugenius gained popularity among the masses by playing on local pagan insurgencies and easing strict religious policies imposed by Theodosius. At first, the latter sought diplomatic ways to resolve the conflict, but it was quite obvious from the beginning that blood would be spilled. The Eastern Emperor managed to rally an army north of 30,000 in number, but this included a sizable contingent of unruly Goths and various mercenaries including Huns, Alans, Caucasians, Arabs, and more. This entire campaign is shrouded in many legends and often stylized as a fateful struggle between paganism and Christianity. Admittedly, Theodosius introduced laws persecuting every religion that wasn't Nicene Christianity, while Eugenius took a lenient stance on the matter, unwittingly championing the pagan factions of Rome. But in fact, both of them used religion for their political goals at the time. Even both armies were roughly a comparable mix of Arians, Nicene Christians, Roman pagans, and various others. 
So the mighty Christian versus pagan clash appears to be nothing more than a romanticization of the events. In the meantime, Theodosius' troops entered the mountain passes extending between Dinaric and Julian Alps. The Eastern Army tried its luck, as moving through rough terrain forced it to dangerously stretch into the valley, and Theodosius, marching among the Imperial troops in the rear, unwisely neglected to perform proper scouting of the area. Still, there was no trace of the insurgents. At last, on the 5th of September, the first units began descending to the Frigidus Valley, and but a glimpse of Arbogast's plan was unveiled. The Western Army had set a fortified camp opposite the mouth of the pass, blocking the way to Italy. A tightly packed infantry phalanx, supported by projectile and cavalry units, guarded the encampment, numbered probably just over 25,000 men, significantly less than the Eastern host. But in such a constricted area, the numbers drew only part of the picture. Upon making visual contact with the enemy, the Gothic vanguard, known for its rather poor discipline, launched a head-on attack towards the camp. Arbogast's men were well prepared for this and, bolstered by some wood-reinforced earthworks, firmly withstood the initial storm of the Goths. The sudden attack could have been the result of poor battle strategy and the Gothic impetuous nature, but the most probable yet vicious reason was Theodosius's hope to deplete the Goths' power and thus make them less of a threat to the Empire in times to come. Whatever the intentions were at play, the Goths were on the verge of breaking, while the rest of the Eastern Army hastily deployed on the plain. Seeing the faltering attack, one of the Eastern generals launched a mounted charge and upon reaching the Westerners, broke through Arbogast's infantry, saving the day and allowing the remainder of the Gothic warriors to escape. It was a costly action though, only adding to the heavy death toll. Many of the cavalrymen perished in this valiant offensive, along with several thousands of Gothic warriors lying dead on the battlefield. The Eastern Emperor was calculating possible moves, but the future of his host was painted with the blackest of colors. As the sun hid behind the mountains, delighted, Eugenius decorated the bravest soldiers and let them all feast, while the mood in Theodosius's camp was rather gloomy. But then, unexpected guests requested to be taken to the emperor's tent. Apparently, one of Arbogast's officers, commanding troops that were meant to ambush Theodosius at the most opportune of moments, offered to switch sides in exchange for important positions in the army. The Eastern Emperor welcomed this surprising advantage as this event breathed new spirit into his army, which prepared for another charge. Moments before dawn, heavy gusts of northeastern Bora wind developed in the valley, which heralded a new attack. For the soldiers in Theodosius's camp, it was a good omen, and the all-out storm hit Arbogast's fortifications hard. Many in the Western Army were caught resting, but the defense refused to give ground. The gusts of wind made their missiles less effective and slightly favored Theodosius's troops. But the fighting was relentless and many died on both sides, regardless of their faith or beliefs. The primary sources offer very limited description of the details. Yet ultimately, among the raging chaos and piles of dead bodies, the Eastern Army started to gain an upper hand, as Arbogast's line had gradually lost cohesion. Unable to turn the tide, his men began scattering one by one. Even noble Arbogast, seeing no hope, fled the battlefield, committing suicide shortly thereafter. His puppet, Eugenius, was less lucky, as he was caught and brought before the Emperor, who showed no mercy and promptly beheaded the usurper. Theodosius emerged victorious against the odds and now, uncontested, extended his authority over the eastern and western part of the empire. Yet this costly victory near Frigidus River severely depleted the military power of both halves and put a major strain on the already weakened state. The challenge resting upon Theodosius was enormous as the foundations of the Roman Empire were crumbling. Yet, We'll never know if he was the right man to change the course of his domain, as he fell ill and drew his last breath several months after the battle. Theodosius left behind his two underage sons, meant to run the state. Yet both Arcadius and Honorius lacked the necessary qualities, and their reigns were dominated by powerful ministers, in a time when a strong ruler was desperately needed to save the falling empire.